Hello and welcome to the Corporate Facility Council's webinar, Resolving Product Label Confusion. And this is a third part in our sustainability series. Our presenters today are Howard Williams and Kendra Mars, and I am the component liaison, Joshua Amos. I do want to let everyone know you have been muted for audio quality. If at any time during this webinar you do have any questions, please type them into the question box and we will be happy to go over them during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. Also, if you are interested in the PowerPoint, um, they have provided a PDF copy of the PowerPoint and you can download that now in the control panel of your GoToWebinar under handouts at the bottom of your screen. And now I give my pleasure to introduce our two presenters. Howard is previously director, excuse me, Howard previously directed the Interiors Division of Construction Specialties, Inc. Through his leadership, the division was recognized for numerous sustainability and environmental initiatives, notably the Pennsylvania Governor's Award for Ex Environmental Excellence 2003 and the US EPA's Mid-Atlantic Region Award for Environmental Excellence 2011. Howard is a member of the Biz NGO for Safer Chemicals and Sustainable Materials Cradle to Cradle Certification Standards Board and the US Green Build Council's Materials and Resources Technical Advisory Group. Howard testified before the U.S. Senate and House, Represent House of Representatives advocating reform of Toxic Substances Control Act. His work in the area of material health led to his cameo in the documentary film, The Human Experiment. Howard's mission is to add his voice and experience to the call for sustainability and safe and healthy products for the benefit of future generations. It's a Horton Here's a Who world and each of us has a voice to add. This co-presenter today is Kendra Mark, who is the Corporate Manager of Sustainability at Construction Specialties, Inc. When focused on the sustainability aspect of the role, she manages environmental product declarations, i.e. cradle-to-cradle product certifications and health product declarations, implements environmental impact reduction strategies, and crafts the corporate sustainability strategy. More recently, she has taken on roles within new product development and innovation sits on the steering committee for the new flexible space management team, led the IWP innovation project, easily cleanable surfaces, and serves as research consultant on market trends for the SBU, excuse me, for the SBU. Her new involvement as a green belt has expanded her results driven and collaborative activities by giving her proven tools and strategies for improving process. Okay, at this time I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Kendra and Howard. Hi, thank you, Josh, and thank you for everyone and your patience today. Sorry for our technical difficulties, but we will dive right in, and hopefully we won't uh, hold you up today, and you can end promptly at 1. Um, so Howard and I both worked at Construction Specialties, which is a specialty manufacturing company that was started in 1948. We are a privately owned U.S.-based company, um, although we do have 17 offices and plants um, around the globe. There are over 70 lead accredited professionals and green associates at our company to help us better connect with those um, in our marketplace. We have several, many pro product lines, and six of our main product lines um, offer cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified products. CS is a solutions-driven manufacturing company that strives to make buildings better. So today we're going to walk you through eco-labels, um, that help you achieve your sustainability goals for your projects and for your facilities. So first we need to define, well, what is sustainability? The most broadly accepted definition of sustainability is to create and maintain the conditions under which humans and nature can exist in productive harmony to support and prevent future generations. Now there isn't one exact definition of sustainability. As you embark on your own personal journey, I encourage you to create a definition that is important to you and it's aligned with your organization's mission. This definition can be your mantra that will help guide your organization through its journey. So sustainability is comprised of kind of five main pillars. Um, they're waste, water, carbon, social, and material health. So the best way and the only way to ensure that nature exists in balance is to address each of these. In just a little, Howard will go into a deeper dive about material health and why it's important, and then I'll pick up the conversation again to explain eco-labels that address material health. Howard? 
Okay, thank you, Kendra. As Kendra listed the uh, aspects of sustainability, material health is an aspect of sustainability that uh, has been lagging behind uh, the other four, and as such, it is gaining uh, a lot of attention, a lot of prominence for, for some very good reasons. Because simply put, that uh, material health brings healthy people. And this slide simply looks a bit back in time where the United Nations uh, Environmental Program began a chemicals and products project. One of their four priorities was to be looking at construction products, all with the goal aimed at a chemical safe world by 2020. And this project began years ago, and 2020 is rapidly moving up onto uh, our calendars. And that simply is here to reinforce that this is, this is getting late attention across a broad brush of the market. And there's a level of urgency associated with that. Thank you. Early on, the environmental work was seen more as we were looking mostly at the carrying capacity of the world. In the 19th century, the big question was, can this one Earth sustain life as the human population grows? I don't think that question has necessarily gone beyond us. It simply uh, comes out every now and then. But that was where today's environmentalism began to grow. And then as it moved, it began to look at natural resource-oriented environmentalism, where those of us and who began caring about uh, uh, the environment, I think, began to be called tree huggers. Then it took another step, and sustainability began to be defined uh, more in the area of, as Kendra defined it, development, meeting the needs of the present without compromising future generations to meet their own needs. And then took a step into social equity. And the question was, will wealthy nations or people buy up all the resources for themselves and they'll no longer be available for the common good of all? Taking yet another step, there began to be prescriptive measures and schemes or uh, plans put in place for green building. And obviously there were, you know, since we're talking about building, we're focused on that. And RIAM in Europe and LEED here in the United States were largely natural resource oriented. And then it stepped into, all right, let's get some people into this because that's a major part of what's going on in the world. So a lot of focus came into play with healthcare without harm. There's collaborative for high performance schools. What are we doing? And are we keeping our, our students focused? Can we give them a healthy environment? And then out came a green guide for healthcare. How to build hospitals? Hospitals deal with people that are already vulnerable. So should a hospital be built differently than an office? And that then generated lead for healthcare. Ultimately, it was recognized in lead version four that material health isn't an issue that only belongs in a hospital or only belongs in a school, but rather belongs in all of the criteria for construction. And today, we now have, or two or three years ago, now uh, a well building standard. How to build a building to encourage uh, wellness. We then move on to uh, the next. And here's where, here's where we begin to look and see what are we concerned about here with these toxic chemicals. First of all, not in this slide, but there's a little baby crawling on the floor there, the symbol of the baby crawling on the floor. Children today uh, are, are being born with upwards to 250 toxic chemicals in their umbilical cord blood. And that is just shocking to think that what was once seen as the very safest place from all of the environmental work uh, issues was the mother's womb. And what we find is that there are over 200 chemicals in that umbilical cord blood. The child has not had water, hasn't eaten anything, hasn't had any creams or lotions rubbed on its skin, and hasn't yet breathed air. And all of that, though, has made its way from the mother through the placenta, through the blood, and into the umbilical cord blood. More on this can be seen in uh, Environmental Defense Fund, and that would be a worthwhile venture for you if you're inclined to look in that direction. 
moving onward, one of the issues that we really thought important uh, in today's conversation and certainly in the previous conversations as we review slides that we have gone through in the past is to really to be looking at how are, how are these uh, programs harmonized? Uh, are is lead for living building, well building, uh, and concepts like biophilic design or the circular economy, and we'll stop there. How harmonized are their standards? Are they generally all looking at the same? And as you'll note, most are. Biophilic design isn't really a building standard, but it's a design that looks at creating social equity and wellness. Lead V4 and living building, the top two on the list, health and wellness is an outcome. It's not an explicit part, but rather when all the checks are, are green, health and wellness resolves, whereas well building uh, is very conscious in its desire to create healthy and well spaces. And then at the bottom, uh, we've listed four uh, professional organizations so that you can begin to look at what are my peers doing? What are the other professional organizations doing? And you'll see across American Institute of Architects, American Society of Interior Designers, IFMA, and ASHI, uh, the American Society of Hospital Engineers. There's great harmony in what is being done within standards and how they're looking at the five principles of sustainability. Also, let's look at this globally and let's look at this on the basis of numbers of people in membership, uh, organizations across the globe, and then to look at uh, the five principles and then outcomes. So as you look at this, whether you're looking at the Royal Institute of British Architects with 28,000 members, the, the first four categories then in the vertical are baseline standards. They're standards that are looked at by all of the organizations, and we've simply faded this from light or, or increased the intensity from light green to dark green as we move across. And baseline standards, whether they're the baseline standards uh, within any organization, that would, that would say, you're doing a good job. You've really got these areas covered. You're looking at waste, carbon management, water stewardship, health, and wellness. But then what really begins to differentiate the organization uh, and really begin to move that organization to some real business goals and outcomes. Uh, you know, higher shareholder value, higher financial performance, uh, more satisfied occupants, more satisfied staff is to beginning when you begin to look at what are you doing within your community and optimize products and services. Optimized products, optimization in this context means that the material has the hazards replaced with safer alternatives and the effectiveness and the efficiency of the use of the product and materials has been increased to really the optimum levels available for today. And how do we bring this together? What areas uh, permit us to understand this in ways that are just not Kendra and Howard talking to you on a webinar? Recently, the Environmental Protection Agency released its recommendations of specifications for eco-labels. And this is the result of a multi-year study. Uh, a number of federal agencies, as well as private organizations came together to evaluate standards for the purpose of giving to the federal buying, federal purchasing a sense of really what, what complies with the federal purchasing requirements, the environmentally preferable purchasing requirements. Federal agencies have been required under executive order since President Clinton so for the last three presidents, federal agencies have been required to buy uh, products and materials in way of, that are environmentally preferable and they meet federal purchasing guidelines. 
and there's been a lot of confusion surrounding that, just as there were lots of confused people in the private marketplace relative to, well, my, my label is this and my label is that, and we're all, all out there selling products on the basis of labels. So the EPA sat down and studied, and the inset that you see in the smaller picture that has the BPI in the upper left, these are the labels that they reviewed. Importantly for our conversation, are we're taking a look today at the leading four building products and material labels associated with their study and associated with uh, other aspects of our industry, which we'll talk about. Now, briefly here, too, I'll add that uh, uh, furniture labels are also uh, within that EPA standard. So it's well worthwhile for you if you're buying new furnishings to go back into that and to look at that. We're simply not looking at that today as we progress through to our next slide. So what are labels and declarations? What, uh, what differentiates them? So we looked into the uh, International Standards Organization and they have a process and a procedure for evaluating eco-label schemes. There are three types of, of eco-labels. Type one is a multi-attribute standard, more than one thing being looked at. Uh, is it transparent? Uh, not only in uh, the terms of transparency is relative to the product, but is the scheme transparent? Is it consensus-based? And is it third party audited as opposed to self uh, declared, which is then that next level, which is the type two self declared environmental claims? Uh, they will be accurate and verifiable, or, or the standard requires that they be accurate and verifiable, and that they prevent and minimize unwarranted claims and reduce confusion. And three of the labels that we're talking about and showing here today. I want to go back up to the type ones. Uh, we actually did not have permission to use the uh, what is called BIFMA, the Furniture uh, Association. We did not have permission to use their label. We put that in there. Um, it's just important because they do a really good job. They didn't deny our permission, our request. They didn't simply didn't get to it in time. And that's a very good label for you if you're looking at furnishings or if you're looking at uh, you know, cubicles and things of that type. The type three is the environmental product declaration, and it deals uh, with quantified environmental information about the product, how much water is used, how much energy is used, and um, there's a prescribed method for that. We're going to look at type one and type two labels today as we progress to our next. It's, uh, there it goes, sorry. <laughs> All right, that's okay. This gives you an example of the uh, EPA recommendations and how they applied the standard. They called hotspots. Each of these categories and each of these cells uh, would be considered a hotspot, things that are very important to them. We aren't going to spend a lot of time on it, uh, except to say that that can help you as you look at Perhaps you're designing your own environmentally preferable purchasing program. Uh, perhaps you're looking at your strategic plan and other aspects of what you do. These cell descriptions and labels could be very helpful for you as you walk through because federal government is obviously a very large purchaser and they're going to be able to help swing the, the market. They already have. Uh, they'll be able to swing it further toward preferable products, and we as manufacturers are definitely moving ourselves and working toward being able to meet those standards. So once met for government, it's uh, also then going to be well met for you. All right. As Howard mentioned, um, there are kind of four main eco-labels that we're going to look at today that are relevant for building products and materials. Um, and each of those four labels 
meets a different part of the criteria along this spectrum of inventory, screen, assess, and optimize. And these are four kind of key words that you're going to hear me talk about um, today throughout the presentation. So I want to make sure that we spend some time to really understand and get a strong foundation about what those four kind of key terms mean and why it's relevant. Um, this inventory to optimize phase is kind of part of the reason why these different eco-labels um, achieve different points for the LEED um, green building standard. And um, this will help you alloc understand which eco-labels you should look for for different projects depending on what the goal is for your project. Um, you might not be going for renovating for LEED, but you do probably want to ensure that your occupants in your facility are exposed to safe materials. And if that's the case, then you want to try to pick, um, you know, products that prefer products that have um, eco labels that get into the optimized phase. So the first step in, of the four critical steps to determining the material health of a product is inventory. And inventory is essentially saying what's in it. You're taking a look into what is the composition of the product of the product. And there are between these four eco labels, um, there's different, there's a variety of different depths that they take a look into these. Um, but I'll explain that in a little bit. The second step is screen. So what, what's not in it? Um, so there's kind of you've heard of probably band list or chemicals to avoid. That what that's what this screen stage means. The third is assess. So the assessment is what are the impacts. You're going beyond screening and you're kind of doing a hazard assessment um, to see, you know, what are the implications of these different chemicals. And it prevents you from making any kind of regrettable substitutions in what product that you pick. And then optimize the fourth and final stage. And it means that it's designed to pose no risk. It means this product is safer. So one of the first eco-labels that we're going to take a look at today is the Health Product Declaration. Um, and that was created by the Health Product Declaration Collaborative. It was a collaborative of architects and designers that actually made this tool. And the Health Product Declaration Collaborative is a nonprofit, nonprofit organization that advocates for material product health and through transparency and constant innovation. The HPD is an open standard for the transparent and consistent reporting, um, the ingredients in building products, and the associated health information. Now, this is kind of an inventory tool, which is the first block on that flow diagram that I just showed you on the last page. Um, it's the first step that a manufacturer can take in helping users learn more about the product. You know, every manufacturer has to start somewhere and, you know, inventory and being um, transparent in what's in your product is a great first step. There are over 15,000 users of the HPD and there are over 1,000 HPDs that you um, as facility managers can um, look at to select products. Now, there's one thing to note that not all of the HPDs that are out there do qualify for LEED V4. Um, but having a complete and compliant HPD is a starting point towards making well-informed product development and product purchasing decisions. And I will walk you through um, some of the best practices and how to decipher what is a good HPD and what isn't. Um, and next. So here is kind of a screenshot of what the new HPD version 2 looks like. This is kind of the summary cover page, if you will. Um, it summarizes all these other kind of areas within the HPD. You have your content inventory, threshold levels, all the different ingredients that are in the product, um, the green screen benchmark, which I'll explain in the next couple of slides, if there's any VOCs for the product, any additional certifications, and if the HPD has been self-declared or if it's been verified by a third party. Um, but the really, the main advantage to this HPD is it is a consistent reporting tool um, that can allow you to help kind of compare um, apples to apples, if you will. And so some of the best practices, again, are to follow the LEED V4 guidelines. And really what the HPD does is it gives you an opportunity while you're purchasing project, products to engage with the manufacturer and ask them questions about their products. If there is something that's a hazard in there, you can ask them, why is it in here? Is this required? Can you switch it out? And always ask for optimization. So here is a zoomed in shot of the HPD, the content inventory. Um, that was the inventory phase one that I kind of mentioned, and I said there are different thresholds of inventory that you can have. 
Um, lead v4, one of the best practices, is in order for an HPD to be lead v4 compliant, you need to check the box for the 100 parts per million and or the 1,000 parts per million. And they're looking at this for each um, material that makes up the product. And there are other options that you can pick if you have a safety data sheet. Um, an HPD can be completed that way, but in that instance, it's not going to be H, it's not going to be lead v4 compliant. The next is kind of the um, content inventory threshold. So um, the first one is this is for option one if you want to qualify for that within lead v4. Is the material characterized. It means what are the percent weights and the roles provided for all of the content. You have to have this little yes box checked. Screened are all the content screened using priority hazard lists. That yes box also has to be checked. And then the last one is identified. Um, are all the ingredients identified and listed? Um, you can have yes or no for this one. Okay, so the next, the green screen benchmark is kind of what I mentioned earlier. Um, this lets you know you're going to see a list of all these chemicals on the HPD, but you're not toxicologist, I'm not toxicologist, so how the heck do you know if this chemical that's listed in here, good or bad? Well, um, the Green Screen for Safer Chemicals benchmark um, was developed by the Clean Production Action, and um, there's kind of two ways that a manufacturer can fill this out. You can use their list translator, which will tell you if it's a, just a benchmark one, two, three, or four. Um, or it can go on and do a full assessment, which is what um, everyone is actually encouraging, LEED and EPA. It's great if you can have a full assessment because that prevents you from having regrettable substitutions. But if not, you can just rely on the list translator and look for benchmark one through four. So if, in order, um, if you want to look for the more optimized material in an HPD, you should be avoiding chemicals that have that benchmark one. And now here, if you see this zoomed in, um, this is kind of what an HPD would look like in terms of just a variety of um, ingredients that would be listed for a product. And you see it says like steel LT1, that's that list translator, the green screen list translator that I was talking about. Um, and then you'll see kind of if you look to the right, you'll see some things like CAN, MAM, those are just kind of the hazards that it was screened against. Um, but what that is, is it's all the ingredients that are in that product and the contents are arranged in um, the descending order of quantity. And if you, so that's kind of just the brief overview of HPDs. If you want me to do a deeper dive into that, you can ask me questions later at the end of the webinar. Um, but you can access HPDs on hpdcollaborative.org, individual manufacturer libraries, go to the Pharos tool, um, GreenSpec, or other uh, product databases. So the second, um, eco-label that we're going to talk about is the Cradle to Cradle Certified. Um, the Cradle, which is owned by the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute. The Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute is an independent nonprofit that is charged with the maintenance and continuous improvement um, of the Cradle to Cradle certification. And it provides a third party verification of compliance. Um, and it's Cradle to Cradle started as a design philosophy, and it was eventually developed into a certification standard that helps to identify products that have a positive impact. So these products have been designed with intent and utilize safe materials that can be perpetually cycled. Certification requires that all products are assessed by a qualified independent organization trained by the Cradle to Cradle Institute every two years. So then at that renewal, um, manufacturers have to show that good efforts were made in order to improve or optimize their products in order to get recertified. And the Cradle to Cradle requires continuous improvement in all five of the multi-attributes that you see there, everything from material health to carbon management. Cradle to Cradle really drives for optimization. So um, going back to that kind of inventory discussion that we had earlier, you're take, let's look at a product and kind of what do I mean by a homogenous material? What do I mean by the entire product? And what are these different levels of inventory? So here you see an example of kind of a laundry detergent bottle. So that is one product. And each homogenous material would be like, what is the sticker on that bottle? What's the cap? What's the adhesive? That's the homogenous material. Um, and it, all these parts are kind of combined to make up your laundry detergent bottle. So then within each of those inks, 
the chemicals um, are going to be assessed down to 100 parts per million under the cradle to cradle standard. Um, so again, that's the level that LEED prefers um, with HPDs, and it's always that way with when you're looking at a cradle to cradle certified product. So here you see um, a simple a sample scorecard. As I mentioned, cradle to cradle is a multi-attribute certification. Um, and you get certified in all of these different five criteria. So you have material health, um, material reutilization, which means can the product be reutilized um, throughout its lifetime? Renewable energy at the manufacturing facility. Has that company invested in renewable energy or offsetting? Um, CO2 emissions, water stewardship, um, are they monitoring, you know, what kind of effluents are leaving their facility, are they trying to decrease water consumption, social fairness, they make us look down um, your supply chains, and if there is a problem, that company that has a certification needs to do something to address it in their supply chains. So the overall uh, certification that a company would get here, if you're looking at the product, um, the sample scorecard would be silver. It goes to the lowest level achievement in any of these five. Um, but if you're looking for a product for LEED V4 and you see an example of this sample scorecard, you'll notice here that the product achieved gold in material health. So that means that this sample product could um, qualify for LEED V4 under option one and option two for the materials and resources credit because they have met the gold material health criteria. So cradle to cradle screens um, hazards and this is part of the assess phase along that four key points of material health and they screen against these 24 different endpoints. I'm not going to describe these, this is just kind of an FYI. Um, and to compare against different eco-labels. So within each of those you know, homogenous materials, each of the chemicals get assessed a risk rating. Are there hazards? There's no data. What are the risks? Um, and at the end of that, um, they will pick, they will look at that in the lowest level, if it's green to red or black band, um, that's how they determine their material health score. Um, and what that means is, you know, at the bronze material health level, there are no C2C bandless chemicals. This is kind of that screen phase that I was talking about. It's looking at the worst of the worst chemicals that are out there, the heavy metals, the really bad um, CMRs, and it's saying there's none of those in this product. The next level is the silver. 95% of the product has been assessed down to 100 parts per million and you are not exposed to any kind of CMRs in that product. And the third is the gold achievement level in material health, and it means that 100% of the product has been assessed and is safe, and this is part of the optimized phase when you hit silver and gold. Okay, this is just another example um, of one of the certifications that the Cradle Cradle Products Innovation Institute offers. This is a material health certificate, and essentially it's um, it's the same exact material health criteria as the full certification. It's just only focusing on material health, and it displays all the information more transparently and more visually, so it's easier for you to identify and understand what's in this product. Um, it says that the material, like here in this sample, it says that the material is optimized, um, and it would, if it met that uh, meet VOC emissions criteria, it would have that kind of information on a certificate as well. And you can access all the material health certificates and full Cradle to Cradle certifications on the web on the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute website, which is www.c2ccertified.org. So one of the um, obvious differences between C2C and HPD um, is probably the transparency of ingredients. That's probably one of the things that you noticed. I wasn't showing you all of the ingredients all the hazards and that sort of thing, and Cradle, Cradle takes that away from you, um, but they are transparent in their standard, and you can access the full reports if you would like to see them from manufacturers. Um, at CS, we have them on our transparency site, and also there are other companies um, like Tarquette that are publishing you know, the hazards of their products. 
the full transparency of them on their website. And there are over 400 Cradle Cradle certifications and scorecards that can be found on C2C's website. And again, if you want to see the full assessment report, um, I encourage you to reach out to some of the manufacturers that are on Cradle to Cradle's website to get that information. So the third eco-label that we're going to look at today is Declare, which is a transparency platform and product database um, that's instrumental in transforming the building, product, and materials market. And this is brought to you by the International Living Futures Institute, who also manages the Living Building Challenge, which some of you may be um, familiar with. And the Declare label kind of answers three essential questions. Where does the product come from? What is it made of? And where does it go at the end of its life? So here are two sample um, certifications that ILFI has. The Declare, which I mentioned, um, it lists the ingredients you can see on there. And 99% of the product is disclosed. And it's screened. It's that screen phase again. It is screened against the Living Building Challenge red list. And it will check down there, it will check the box if it's compliant or if it's free of those red list chemicals. And again, this is one of the um, certifications that is self-declared. Now, um, ILFI recently released another eco-label, which is a living product challenge. It's essentially the same thing as DECLARE, except for they added another component to it to make it a multi-attribute. They have the, you know, the carbon, water, waste, and energy attributes on it as well. And it is encouraging um, manufacturers to create positive handprints, meaning their product should be doing good for the rest of society. Um, and they also need to have a plan in place to reduce their chemical footprint. Okay. And the last one is the last eco label that we're going to talk about today is the green screen. And this is the same green screen that I mentioned a little bit earlier on when I was talking about the HPD. Um, green screen for safer chemicals is an open, transparent, and publicly accessible method for chemical hazard assessment. And it's really utilized by a lot of um, other platforms. It's kind of a, it's a standard in their hazard assessments. Um, and you can use this for LEED V4 projects as well. All right, so hopefully you're all still with me and you uh, didn't glaze over after that. Um, in-depth analysis, but so I'm just going to pause here and remind you, if you do have any que uh, questions about anything that I just discussed, please do um, enter your questions into the chat box um, before we kind of move on to the next higher level portion of the presentation. Um, so again, just to reiterate everything, the four main paths um, towards optimization are inventory, screen, assess, and optimize. And you can see where all of the different eco-labels that I just described to you fall along that path. Howard? Recently, the uh, very involved blogging group in Habitat uh, recently published on green building labels. It's uh, at the very bottom of the slide. It's a link to that uh, that assessment, and we're just we're just not going to spend time on it necessarily. But uh, that's a great place to go to get a little bit more information about labels uh, from the viewpoint of a very involved, uh, uh, very well grounded uh, blogging group in Habitat. All right. In, at uh, 2016 AIA, I had an opportunity to be on a panel with Paula uh, McAvoy and Ann Harney Hicks as we talked about uh, building materials. And we created an interview form. This is uh, our suggestion that you consider using that as you interview suppliers because one of the most second most important things you can do to market transfer for market transformation is to begin talking with uh, suppliers. Suppliers will take your questions back and uh, begin, oh, they're asking for this, or yes, they have been, and I've heard this, and I need to do that, and we need to change, and we need to transform. And this list could also be very helpful if you were at the point where you may be looking to uh, revise or 
uh, start all over again with some of your environmentally preferable purchasing uh, aspects and questions and simply read down through that. You'll also notice that the very same labels that we spoke of today are highlighted in the material ingredient areas, including the BIFMA level. And that's largely because not only is the AIA looking at it, the U.S. Green Building Council uh, consider these the primary labels uh, for compliance with LEED V4 materials and resources. Next. One of the initiatives that are that is going on in the market is harmonization. Um, you know, I only walked you through four of the leading eco labels out there in the market, and there were still a lot of complexities to it, um, and that really confuses a lot of people, and it also makes it challenging for manufacturing. Um, so there's been a recent push by those various um, eco label organizations and by architects and designers. Um, out there to try to harmonize these, not make it as difficult, not make it as, um, not make each of these eco labels extremely polarized or different to really drive change in the market. Um, and there has been a lot of really good harmonization efforts going on. And what this has allowed is it's um, set up the adoption of material health credit um, for lead V4. Um, it's simplified the process for us manufacturers. And hopefully it started um, making the selection and specification of healthy materials easier and get and it's been getting better products on the market faster. So one of the um, most well-known harmonization efforts going on right now is um, Mindful Materials. It is a program that was started by the architect firm HKS. Um, and it is a library um, for various manufacturers to disclose all of the certifications, recycled content, VOC information um, for their products in, a, in one standardized format. Um, and all the products in this library are organized by the CSI division, so it's easier to pick out products that way. Um, and all of this, this product library is available to all users for free. So um, as facility managers, you can go to Mindful Materials website and you can sign up and then you have immediate access then to any of the manufacturers that have participated in this program and you can use this um, to select products that participate in kind of some of the eco labels that we talked about today. So this is an example of what the mindful materials label looks like if you are um, have a product library that you commonly use. Um, you'll notice here that it has cradle cradle at the top for the optimization, and then it goes into Declare, HPD, um, and it also has areas for if a manufacturer just wants to have an, a material ingredients list or an EPD, which is an environmental product declaration. So this is an easy way for you know, architects, designers, facility managers, if you have product catalogs or anything like that, you can walk through the library where you store this information, and if you see that little Mindful Materials logo on there, you'll be like, oops. I know this product has at least one of these certifications, and maybe I should prefer these products. Um, what a manufacturer has to go through um, is they will select any and all of the certifications and information that they have on their products, whether they're participating in Cradle to Cradle, HPD, is that product PVC free, what are the VOCs, um, recycled content, that sort of thing. And what this is really doing is this is really driving home the idea that this is not an either or. It's no longer the battle of the eco labels. Um, it's really trying to get this harmonized message out there and just prefer products with these key eco labels. So I really encourage all of you to go and visit this website and um, participate in this program. It'll probably make your um, product specifying much easier for you. Here we're looking at VOC content and emissions, VOCs, volatile organic compounds. These are labels that address that. And our point here is that knowing that there are VOCs and that they are off-gassing, uh, that's important. Knowing their limit or knowing that there are none is most important. However, VOCs originate from generally from uh, materials that you don't want in your product. So when we see these labels, 
they are good. They're going to tell us whether uh, we're exposed to certain chemicals. However, there's always room for improvement, not on the labels. We're not talking about the labels. These labels are good and very intentional for what they do. The room for improvement goes back to the manufacturer. Uh, let's not have hazardous materials in the product that off-gas. If you remove the hazardous materials, you're generally removing the off-gassing. So when you see these, the manufacturer has done something but they've really not moved very far. They're probably anywhere from five to eight years in the past. Leave V4, materials and resources, and here we were showing the declare, the HPD, uh, the green screen, and the cradle to cradle. And what our intent there is that there are four starting points, uh, but ultimately there's one goal and that is creating safer products for humans and the environment and encouraging transparency, encouraging optimization, encouraging evaluation of products uh, and ultimately innovation that creates uh, the new products that are going to be needed as we complete this, this work. Sustainable design, who's doing this? Uh, owners and developers uh, around the world, major brands, uh, Walmart, Target, uh, Patagonia, Dell, Hewlett Packard, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, Google, universities, architects are continuing to drive this forward in their own standards, in their own ways, and Generally, the, the standards and ways are, are reasonably close. We've shown you some of the uh, harmonization programs. So the world is doing this right now, right along with you. You're not out there on your own. Today's learning objectives. Uh, we sought to give you enough information to help you identify and select programs. Uh, we showed you briefly in Habitat uh, EPA a little more fully and mindful materials. They are great areas to give you that background to make those selections if that's where you are. Uh, comparing the alignment. How does IFMA's sustainability program align with its peers and professional organizations? And as you saw on the bottom of bottom four on the slide that included the green check marks and also uh, as you would have seen there on the uh, increasing intensity of greenness on a global scale, uh, IFMA's sustainability aligns really well uh, with its peers and with architects and designers. And then how are you going to make this happen? What are you going to do? How can you develop product specs and purchasing guidelines? You likely already have them. It's a matter though, perhaps we've given you some extra tools, the interview guide from uh, AIA 2016 a look into what backs up the federal purchasing uh, selection decision guide relative to eco labels, and then the architect and design guide library uh, mindful materials. So, you, you know, we're we're now available for questions. Although we uh, we only have a, a few minutes, but we'll turn this back over to Josh to. Uh, facilitate questions. Great. Thank you, Howard. And just as a reminder, um, to ask a question on your control panel, there's a question box, so feel free and type it into there and I'll be able to read it. We do have a question. It was back when you were going over the um, the label. It says, cubicle furniture remanufacturers, would they be certified in any of these categories for product certification? They very well could be. Remanufactured and recycled products uh, are sometimes very difficult to uh, take apart as to their content. However, if you're dealing with uh, a company that's refurbishing their own their own products, they will most likely be able to comply and they may very well already comply. So it's a matter of uh, really understanding the ingredients in there and recycling can sometimes be challenging, but refurbishing should be available. Excellent. And it says, 
Is the presentation recording available? Um, yes. Um, if you want to copy a PDF copy of the PowerPoint, it's available in the handout section of your control panel. And then later on, a copy of the recording will be available um, through the CFC website. There's an archive section of podcast. I mean, webinars on there as well. Okay. Uh, we'll give it just a moment before we close out for the day. We're almost at time anyways. And so if you do have any questions, feel free and type them in. Okay. I don't see anything else coming in. Well, Kendra and Howard, I want to thank you for concluding a great sustainability series. It's been great having you. Thank you, Josh, thank you. for having us. Yes, thank you for your work. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.